Amen and amen. Good morning, dear brothers and sisters. This morning is the fourth Sunday in the season of after Pentecost, or the season of ordinary time. So I love that we mark our time together in this season based on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was given and when the church was born. Here at Hope Church, we long to be a place that everything in our lives is lived in subordination to Christ, in submission to Christ. And one way that we do that is through following the church calendar. Through the church calendar, even our time <laughs> and the way we number our days is submitted to the Lord. So this morning, we can, we're continuing our journey through the book of Mark, looking at these kingdom encounters. And we'll be looking specifically at Mark chapter 4 this morning, at two short parables that I just read where Jesus uses, that Jesus uses in order to illustrate the nature of the kingdom. So we'll be looking specifically at Mark chapter 4 verses 26 through 34. So if you'd like to follow along, now would be a good time to flip over there. So the topic we'll be discussing this morning is kingdom growth, kingdom growth. So there's been a, a lot of growth happening in my family and in my house recently. And I don't mean in the garden, right? I've told you about this before. But I tried to plant a garden a few years ago, and what happened was every single plant that I grew, the deer mowed directly and immediately to the ground. Now what I mean is, we, the growth has been happening within our family. We've had baby Blair within the last couple months. And it's been amazing to watch her grow. And to see how quickly she's gone from just lying around, not really interacting with the world, to beginning to smile, beginning to move around more. It's incredible how fast it seems that they change when they're really little, but... I, while I know that my other kids are growing, it's often difficult to see it happen, right? It isn't until you put that pair of pants on or that pair of shoes on that used to fit where it becomes obvious that they're actually growing. Now, their physical growth is perhaps only surpassed by their mental and their emotional growth. One day they're screaming and crying and then the next day, they're still screaming and crying, but they're also beginning to use their conflict resolution skills as well. But the same is true of our own growth. Now, we often experience such incremental changes in the course of our lives that they almost feel imperceptible day by day. But suddenly, we find ourselves in new territory, right? This is exactly how it works when it comes to our physical health. We have a cookie one day... It doesn't make that much of a difference, right? But if we have a cookie day in and day out, for a couple of months we begin to step on the scale and the number starts to creep up a little bit, right? But it works in the positive as well. You exercise faithfully and nothing is really noticeably happening ever. But with time and consistency, we begin to notice our clothes fitting a little bit differently, right? They fit a little more loosely. However, this is not the answer that our culture wants or desires. Every advertisement we see, no matter what product it's for, is selling a vision of the good life. More so than even selling the actual product, right? It's how you'll look if you use this product that's the sales pitch. Even ridiculous products, right? Like the shake weight, if you remember that one. Because they make promises that they cannot keep. Now, that's a, sin a silly example and probably too dated for some of you to even remember. But still, this year, the weight loss industry hit a historic high when the market segment reached nearly $90 billion annually. Now, there are only 72 countries in the world that have a GDP higher than $90 billion. And therefore, 115 countries produce less than the single industry. But at the same time, if you look at the results that people experience when they spend money in this category, only about 20% of those actually maintain any sort of long-term results. 80% are left longing 
disappointed, longing for something more, looking for the next thing that might bring about the desired results. But weight loss is not the only area of our lives where we're tempted to believe that there might possibly be a shortcut. Images of the good life are all around us. If we have this or that, then we will finally feel fulfilled. Whether it be the perfect body or money or social media followers or stuff or power or sexual fulfillment or successful children or whatever else it is, if there's a way to sell you a vision of the good life, of a better life, someone will try it and through it they will gain money and influence and power over you. And so the cycle continues over and over again. So Jesus, the revolutionary, had wildly different ideas about how the kingdom of God was to be marketed, if you will. One would be safe in assuming that if Jesus were coming to start a new religion, if that was his intention, he might speak to the grandiose desires of of the human heart. He might teach that the kingdom of God is like earthly kingdoms, just better. And if he were going to use parables like he does to teach about the kingdom, if he were trying to sell this picture of a better kingdom, it would make sense for him to choose the grandest things in the world to compare his kingdom. Something like the kingdom of God is like the cedars of Lebanon. We even heard it in, in, the, in our Old Testament passage. It was a familiar and a majestic image, which though it starts small, smaller than the tip of your little finger, the, the cedar seed starts Yet it grows to a tree that's over 100 feet tall and up to 10 feet in diameter. This is not where we see Jesus go, right? So let's read together, picking up in Mark, in in verse 26 of Mark 4. Jesus says, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seeds on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when it's ripe, at once he puts the sickle because the harvest has come. So what on earth does this mean? It's a fair question. It certainly doesn't inspire me a great desire to run to Jesus for selfish gain. There's no promise of power or prominence or anything else really. It's just a description of a natural process that would have been incredibly familiar to all of the people who were listening at this point. Surely the expectation was that it would be something different, though, something extraordinary, maybe even supernatural, like like God had done in the past. The kingdom of God surely will be like God leading us with a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Surely he'll part some great bodies of water or something profound and obvious. Jesus teaches that the kingdom of God is like normal stuff we do. It's the the simplest explanation of this parable is then that God is in charge of growth in his kingdom. People in his kingdom are like seed scatterers who have no idea how it works, but in faith scatter the seeds and let God do the growing. And God will do the growing. That's the promise here. The parable contains a certain inevitability of growth in the kingdom. And it seems that we won't ever really understand how it's going to work. But over time, slowly but surely, the kingdom will grow. We are simply invited to scatter the seeds and to let God do the work that only he can do, which is bringing growth. Being invited to participate in that process, though, is an incredible gift. As anyone who's ever planted seeds and seen them actually sprout knows that this is amazing. So too, anyone who has ever shared the good news of Jesus with someone else and seen them grow knows that it it is incredible and it's up to God to do the work in their lives. Let's take for a moment and look at our second parable, though. Let's read it together. Jesus said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown in the ground is the smallest of all seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up to become, and becomes larger than all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. 
Here we finally have some triumph, right? We finally get this beautiful, amazing kingdom that God has promised. The kingdom is going to grow into a majestic tree. That's not what he says. We're talking about a mustard plant here. The the seed was certainly proverbial in the ancient world for being the smallest of all seeds. The plant isn't exactly majestic. In Israel, the mustard plant can essentially is essentially a shrub, right, that grows up to about 10 feet tall. Cedars or oaks seem like the, the metaphor that we should be seeing here. An acorn grows into a large tree. It, the same metaphor could be the same here. An oak tree is huge. Yet Jesus chooses the mustard seed. It isn't necessarily the size of a mustard plant that's impressive at all. But the point is that, not that it's huge, but that it's impossible to ignore. It's impossible to ignore. That something that comes from a seed that's almost imperceptible in size can grow into something that is impossible to ignore and that can provide a place of respite and shade for the birds of the air. And this is in itself miraculous. So too, the kingdom of God, though it begins almost imperceptibly small, grows into something that can provide shade and rest for the people of the world. So what does this mean for you personally? That's the, the, the real question we all come to the text with. How do these parables about hidden growth, the hidden growth of God's kingdom, apply to our lives Well, first, I think it it requires that we embrace the mystery of growth. Just as the farmer scatters seeds and trusts the natural process of growth, so you are called to trust in the work of God in your life. Even when it doesn't make sense, even when it seems like you aren't actually growing, simply acknowledge that you don't understand how it works and trust that God is doing the work of growing. Next, be patient with yourself. Growth happens with time and in stages. Spiritual growth in the heart of the believer is the way that God's kingdom grows. And it's gradual. God is perfectly capable of accomplishing what he sets out to accomplish. Will you trust him as he grows the kingdom within and around you? Similarly, will you who trust God with the growth, will you trust God with those, with the growth of those who are around you? Now, we are far too quick, I think, as, as Christians to write off other people because they aren't growing at the speed that we would like. But can you trust the signs of progress and walk with others while scattering seeds, knowing that God is the one who is responsible for the outcomes? Now, if you're confident that God is responsible for the outcomes, it frees you up to actually participate in the growing of his kingdom actively. So try to find new ways to scatter seeds daily. Sow the seeds of scripture in your heart. Pray. Seek to serve someone else every day. Knowing that no matter how small the seed that you sow is, that God can use it to grow into something significant. Finally, I would say that we are being invited here to provide refuge and support for others. Be a shelter, just as the mustard seed provides shelter and shade for the birds. We are called to operate as spaces of refuge and support for others. So look for ways to offer hospitality, encouragement, and care. Now we are inclined to look for the next big thing. It's where we began our time together in terms of looking for these visions of the good life. We want to be a part of something that that gains us prominence or significance We desire to have whatever vision of the good life is that's compelling to us, and we love it if we can find shortcuts to get there. What if growth in the way that God designed it is meant to be almost imperceptible? What if God right now is growing his kingdom among us in impossible to ignore ways that only those who have eyes can see? Now, at a recent men's event, we took a moment to encourage one another. The rules were that you had to say something encouraging to the person who was next after you in line, and they were only allowed to respond with thank you. 
Now, it was amazing to hear some of the things that people were saying. And in every situation, what somebody was describing was growth. Though imperceptible to the world, and perhaps even to the person receiving the encouragement, was there to behold for those who had eyes to see. Sometimes it just requires someone else to point out to us what they see happening within us. The image of providing a place of refuge is incredibly compelling to me. And I believe that it's something that we should strive for together. And I'll just leave you with three P's this morning. Any good preacher, I'll leave you with three P's. In terms of how I think this might be able to play out at Hope. So first we should pray for growth. Pray. It's first P. We should pray for our own growth and for the growth of others here. For the growth of those whom God has put us in relationship with. And that they might commit to coming here to pursue growth together with us. Second P is prepare. So let's prepare to scatter seeds. So next Wednesday we are starting um, a nine-week series looking at just this topic, right? How do we go about the word, the work of spreading kingdom seeds in our lives? So if you join us, let us discuss together and seek the Lord as we continue this journey of being seed spreaders in the world. And our final P is perceive. Let us seek to perceive the growth that is among us already. Let's share these observations with one another so that we might proclaim. There's another P, fourth P for you. To one another the wondrous works of God's growth. So let us pray, let us prepare, let us proceed, perceive, and proclaim. I offer this to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.